Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Gavin Calver, CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. Gavin Calvert, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. I know your parents mm. and ministered with your parents over many, many years. Um, your grandparents yep. were in ministry yep. and your parents. Uh, let's start there. Tell us a bit about your parents and grand grandparents. Okay, it's a crazy family I'm from. So my dad started Spring Harvest yes. and was the head of the Evangelical Alliance. Um, my granddad was the head of the Evangelical Alliance and started Tear Fund. And yes. so I need a really good idea. If you can help me, I need a good oh, idea quick. That's amazing. I now work for the Evangelical Alliance leading it. And the biggest challenge in that actually was this isn't predictable. I didn't end up here by osmosis. You know, God's got a funny sense of humour. OK, so you're growing up in this Christian home and you get banned <laughs> from going to church. Did, yeah. Now, am I right you get banned for six months? Yeah. yeah. Right, go on. Yeah. You tell us that story. <laughs> OK, I'm one of four kids. The other three are geniuses. I didn't get the brains. I got the looks. The other three are much more conformist, behaved better, everything else. And then there was me, the one who liked to kick against the system. And so at the age of 14, myself and my best friend were banned from Sunday school for six months. I remember telling my mum, you can't even make me go now, which at the time was a relief to me. But I couldn't go. I wasn't allowed to go. Yes. But it is kind of sad as well, because it was four and a half years till I came back to Jesus. Yeah. How did your parents react when you were banned from going to church? Um, I think it's fair to say that my mum at first took the Sunday school teacher's side, which was, a, with hindsight, a mistake, because you heard the words that you don't want to hear. But in reality, they, they journeyed with me. They did, did something I didn't know about till later. They asked 10 people, pray every day that our son had come back to Jesus. Yes. And if I'd known at the time, I'd have been furious. Sure. But when I came back to faith four and a half years later, I found out. Yes. And I got to do something. We don't do this anymore. It's old school. I wrote 10 letters, stuck them in the post, thanking these people for praying for me. Amazing. And you get the letters back, smudges and everything else, because they've cried as they've realised that the prayers they've prayed for years yes. have been answered. Absolutely. And you know, for, in some ways, you want to do one thing evangelistically. Start your prayer list. That's the first thing. Yeah. Pray for people to meet Jesus. I know. Be intentional because when we pray, coincidences happen. Completely. Now, your parents um, emigrated to America for ministry and um, you were 17 but decided not to go. And then at your 18th birthday, mm. you had a few drinks. Mm. Tell us about that and then tell us what happened the day after. Yeah, it was a bit of a bonkers season. I'm 17 years old and at that point, Jesus is an auntie figure. Someone I know exists, but I don't really like hanging out with. So you kind of, it, he's part of my life, but not massively. My parents say they're emigrating to run the American Tear Fund, the equivalent. Yes. I tell them if a loving God wants to split the family, he can stuff himself. Didn't quite put it like that. They emigrated. For six to nine months, I messed about. I don't need to glorify that or no. talk about it, but six to nine months, I wish I could didn't do. Yes. Then my 18th birthday party, I attempted something very foolish in the amount of alcohol you could drink. And I basically was, had poisoning. My best friend, who I was banned from Sunday school with, who to this day has not been in a church building except for my wedding, he, he woke up on the hour every hour to check I was okay, cleared some vomit from my mouth at times. Yes. It was quite scary. The next morning I woke up and I thought, hang on, this is all a bit serious. And I went and sat on a park bench in Mayo Park in Forest Hill, South London. No one was there. There was no mood music, nothing like that. There was no gospel appeal. And I just cried out to the Lord. And I said, I've tried everything else. None of this works. Uh, it's you, you're the meaning behind the universe. And on this park bench, I surrendered my life to Jesus, there and then. And then I prayed something really dangerous. I said, Lord, I will go wherever, whenever, and whatever for you. Yes. And that's led me to doing loads of jobs I never wanted to do, and a journey of an adventure that's different. But for me, I'm all or nothing. And it was that point I realised I was all in for Jesus. And my life has been completely different ever since. Ever since that ever day. Ever since. So, on a park bench, the day after your 18th birthday, mm. and you have this encounter with Jesus. So you go off to um, Bible College. Um, it's, was it called London London Bible, Bible College, College yeah, in yeah. those days? Yeah. And now it's called London School of Theology. That's where you met your wife. Yep, yep. Uh, got married. You, you found that um, you couldn't have children. Tell us that story. Yeah, that was hard. Yeah, because we, uh, we went to Youth for Christ. We were working at Youth for Christ. 
and we did a lot with young people. Yeah. And I'll be honest, until, I, until we started trying to have kids, my biggest weakness was an unawareness of any weaknesses. Yes. I just, you, know, you just need to minister out of brokenness. I hadn't experienced that yet. And we were trying for kids for a few years and I felt really sorry for my wife because she clearly had a fertility issue. And we went through the tests and she was fine and it was me. And I remember sitting in the doctor's surgery as the doctor says, I'm really sorry, but you'll almost certainly never have children. Yeah. Um, but do keep trying, but you'll almost certainly never have children. That same week, a 14-year-old girl in our youth group told us she was pregnant. Yeah. And you're like, what do I do with this? And we didn't know what to do with that. But the month after I was told that, Anne got pregnant. It's incredible. Saviour, he can move the mountains. He can also impregnate women from sterile men if he wants. Yeah. And so our daughter, Emily, came along, which was amazing. And we were like, this is wonderful. There was an outside chance in my condition of having a girl, impossible to have a boy. About 18 months later, my dad's over. My parents live in the States, as we said before, but they're British. So I went out to get the national dish of the country. I went out to get a curry. And I come back with this curry and my wife, Anne's crying. And my dad looks like he's seen a ghost. And Anne says, I'm pregnant again. Yes. And I said, forgive me, I said, who's the dad? Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously it was another miracle. Yes. We went for the scan. You know, you go for the scan. And just to help any guys watching this who haven't had kids yet, even though you can't see it and it looks like a sultana type mushroom thing, yes. pretend it's cute. So I'm pretending it's cute. We're watching this scan. And the midwife says, Reverend and Mrs. Calver, I'm really sorry. The reason there's no sound is your child's not got a heartbeat. It's died in the womb. And in this moment, I'm like, I don't know what to do, Lord. I can deal with miracles. I can deal with sure. none. But this feels like you're teasing me. And my daughter, Emily, who was about 18 months, came and hugged me on the leg. Mm. And it's the clearest I've heard God speak to me in my life. I felt I heard him say, do not be ungrateful for that which you don't have. Yes. But be grateful for that which you do. Yes. And be faithful to me as I'm faithful to you. Now, by this point, and I'm sorry, this is quite a long story. But by this point, um, you're like, OK, fine. Crack on. Two years later, Anne gets pregnant again. I've accepted I'm healed. Because let's be honest, every time anyone says fertility issues come to the front, I was there at the front getting prayed for. And she's pregnant again. And at 18 weeks, we find out we've got a real problem because the baby's really sick. Yeah. We also find out it's a boy, which I was told was physically impossible for me to have a boy. Baby's really sick. There's antibodies in your blood. Some are really rare. Anne and I have got really rare ones playing off with each other. Baby's really anemic. It's got a 5% chance of survival. And we're told there's two donors on the blood list with the right blood in the whole of the UK. The next day, they're going to do a blood transfusion in the womb. So 18 weeks, baby's about this big, Anne lies there. They put a needle through her stomach, into her womb, into the baby's stomach, take out half the blood, put the other half in. The risk at this point is heart attack. Yes. Now they say as well that, that what then happens, Anne sleeps her off for four hours, then we scan. If the baby's moving, we fight another day. If it's not, it's over. Because there's no cure, it's just intervention. I sat by Anne's bed and I felt compelled to pray a prayer. I prayed this out loud, Lord Jesus, if this baby lives, you're good. And if this baby dies, you're still good. Yes. Somehow I get up tomorrow and say that you're good. Yeah. Baby was moving. We fight another day. Anne had 38 scans. She went in for blood tests every other day. <clears throat> we had nine of these transfusions in the womb. Each time I prayed that same prayer. At 30 weeks, they said this to us. They said, better out than in. Normally at 30 weeks, you're panicking. Yes. They said, better out than in. Yes. So they delivered our baby, tiny little baby. He had to go straight off to an incubator for yeah. quite a while. But they said they'd hold him up to show us. So they held him up to show us. At this moment, our tiny little baby wheezed in the face of the person delivering him. It's a comedy moment we all needed. He then went into an incubator. We called him Daniel because he survived his own lion's den. Yes. A few months later, he came home with us. He's now totally fine. In fact, he plays in golf for a semi-professional team, Harefield United near here. Amazing. And, and he's doing really well. He's a 10-year-old lad. But, but the thing for me is this. Before that whole season, I didn't minister out of brokenness. Yeah. When I realised I was broken, leaned into Jesus, pushed into Jesus, became more like him and less like my own self. It's changed everything. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say, Gavin, um, to couples that are tuned in now and they really would love to have children and for some reason it's not happening? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I would say to anyone who's struggling in this journey, and it is hard, you have month after month, you know, you can't get away from it. It feels like it's in your face all the time. I would say the greatest thing Anne and I tried to do was learn to be satisfied with each other. That sounds awful, doesn't yeah. it? But I didn't marry her because she could make babies. Yeah. I married her because I loved her and that together we could be more in Jesus. So I would say firstly that to, to, to learn to accept what you have in front of you. Yes. And then beyond that, what I would say is extend your table. So one of the things we do, because we always thought we'd have a massive family. By the time Daniel had been born, we got, they sorted me out fairly quickly. <laughs> yes. But, but we're always extending our table to say, yes, I might not be biologically your parent, but there's room for you here. 
And as I look out as a youth worker and yeah. as an adult, and if I look out on the nation, I think fatherlessness in particular is, is the problem of our day. Yes. Um, there are many people for you to father. Absolutely. And it's also, it's okay to be upset about it. Yeah. It's okay. We, we, we're philosophical about the child we lost, but we're upset about it too. Sure. And that's okay. So I'd say learn to be satisfied with one another, keep going, and where possible, don't look sideways. Because so, if you start yeah. saying life isn't fair, you're right, you're right, life's not fair. Yeah. Don't look sideways, look upwards. Look upwards. So helpful, Gavin. Obviously, you've done various ministry things with Youth for Christ and, and other areas. Uh, you're now the CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what is the Evangelical Alliance? Yeah, well, we're the oldest and largest unity organisation seeking to represent two million evangelicals in this country. Basically, people who believe the Bible's the inspired word of God. Yes. Stop changing it to fit your culture. Change your culture with the truth in it. Yes. The death and resurrection of Jesus, most important thing in human history. The need for conversion. You don't come to faith by osmosis. You get on your knees and you meet your saviour. And then finally, the need to be active, making the world like the kingdom. That's who, that's who we are. We have two top level aims. Unite the church in their mission to the lost. Secondly, provide a clear and effective voice into every layer of society. Amazing. So during this season we're in, Yes. Loads of unprecedented access to the corridors of power. Great. Doesn't mean we get listened to, but we're there. That's, that's the first step. We often yeah, get listened to. you have a to. voice. We're there. Second bit, we've got the greatest evangelistic opportunity of our lifetime. Come on, church, crack on. How do we put everything in one place to help church? How do we cheer that on? Evangelical, too often, is defined as a negative term. It's a positive term. Yes. It's from evangel, good news. We are the good news people. Yes. And so we are the people that are desperate to see society turned inside out, upside down, and back to front for Jesus. My privilege is to lead the umbrella body that represents and pulls that together. As, and Gavin, what an umbrella body it is. Uh, you know, so often it, the church is presented very negatively, uh, that it's declining. But, you know, you're this umbrella ministry that represents two million um, vibrant Christians, which is hugely encouraging. So are, are, are you encouraged? I'm, I'm encouraged, but I want more. So I'm encouraged by church growth. I'm encouraged by reverse mission. You know, for years we sent missionaries all over the world. Yeah. They're all now coming here, which is yeah. fabulous. Of Some course. of the most exciting churches that you and I would know and sometimes have the privilege to minister yes. in, are, are from all kinds of parts of the world. I'm encouraged as well that where the gospel is preached and the Bible is lived by, churches are growing. You know, and I'm encouraged too that younger generations are engaging in the same way. Where I want to see more is, I truly believe in my lifetime there's going to be a major move of God in the UK. Yes. I really believe we're going to see revival. I do. And, and if we don't, I'll die believing it's coming tomorrow. But I, I believe we might same. see it. And, Absolutely. And I don't know what you think about this, but I think we're living in the most bittersweet moment. Yes. Bitter. It's awful what's going on with COVID, people dying, people struggling, awful. But we're living with something called mortality salience in the UK at the moment. Yes. People are aware of their brokenness. It's like a war zone. Yeah. Normally, you'd only ask the questions you're asking at the moment in a war zone. People are asking, why am I dying? Where, where do I go? What happens? The, the, the nation is open to the gospel. You just got to see your, your garden fence is your pulpit. Your street is your parish. And we all need to crack on. We're showing people next door what's different when you have Jesus and you face COVID. It doesn't mean COVID's not hard, but what's different with Jesus? Yeah, totally. Well, now, when it, back to being mm. a Christian who is rooted in scripture, uh, you know, the sea out there, Gavin, it's kind of feels overwhelming at times. And there is this battle with liberalism. Mm. Um, how are you endeavouring to encourage the churches that are associated with the Evangelical Alliance to remain faithful to Scripture? Yeah, I think, I think we have to acknowledge the landscape we're in. Yeah. So a load of Christians, you talked about my parents before. Yeah. When my dad was leading EA, there was loads of stuff that you could accept as given. The landscape yes. wasn't easy. I never want to say that because no. everyone thinks their generation's the hard time. No, 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 no. It's just different. Yes. But we're living in a time now where... where Biblical inerrancy is, is considered something normal to people. Yeah. Yeah. To other people, it's considered the opposite. The, the sacred stuff that people used to hold to isn't necessarily held to. Yes. In the middle of that, we have to stand strong on the rock of ages. So we're saying to people, follow scripture before you follow culture. Yes. But we're also saying, acknowledge there is a secular tsunami. Yeah, there is. There's a secular tsunami coming. But I don't think in the United Kingdom there's been a more important time in recent memory where we have to live in the light of eternity. 
Yeah. We know the end of the story. I love the early church. You look at them. They knew the end of the story. We know the end of the story. However many bad things happen, how many wars, rumours of wars, persecution, however many good things happen, cures for incurable diseases, revivals, how many, ever, many World Cups England win, however much good or bad there is, the end's the same. Jesus wins. And I'm not sure enough Christians yeah. are living in the confidence of the end of the story. Yeah. So we depend on the word, we believe in the end of the story, then we stand strong in this moment. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. Um, but sadly, so many people who were faithful in their faith, um, they basically um, change their theology to fit in with their morality. Mm. Um, so what encouragement would you say to us as Christians? Uh, about remaining faithful. Yeah, I think we need to choose to not listen with our eyes and think with our feelings. Yeah, I think we've got too much of this going on. So if you have a feelings-based theology, it's going to be completely different to the Word of God. There are moments where, and I shouldn't say this as the head of the EA, where, where the Word of God can feel like a stone in your shoe. Yeah. It goes against everything you're yeah, being taught yeah, yeah. everywhere else. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. And I think what we need to do is, it's like you were saying, we need to choose that even if we feel on the wrong side of history, we're on the right side of eternity. Yes. And into that space, we have to choose who are we living for? Absolutely. You know, do, I, do I want the world to love me? Yes. But do I care more that Jesus is proud of what I'm doing? Yes. yes. So if I have to be Stephen, stoned by the world, stood to by Jesus, I'll be Stephen. Would I rather be someone else? Yes. yes, but if I must be Stephen. And, and I think into this culture, we've too often accepted the wrong idea of what it means to be kind. Yeah. When I took on leading EA, I felt the Lord say to me very clearly, for the next decade, EA needs to be braver than it's ever been. I think there's some stuff we need to go for. We need to take some bullets for the church. We need to go out on a limb. We need to be ludicrously brave. But we also, in tandem with that, we need to be kinder than we've ever been. Those two things are not exclusive. No. Now, the world makes them exclusive because kindness means that you love everything about me. No, it doesn't. God yeah. loves you just the way you are, but too much for you to stay the way you are. He wants you to be like Jesus. Yeah. So we need to be brave and make a stand on some stuff, but we need to be really kind. It's a bit like um, yes. the guy that got banned from church with me. Yeah. He's an employment law barrister. He's completely against everything I do. He's an atheist. He came to my commissioning to this role. At the end of it, he said, do you know what? I disagree with everything you stand for everything you're giving your life to and all you're throwing yourself at. But you know what, Gav? Well done, mate. I'm proud of you. You know, a brave and kind Christian yes. can have relationships with people with polarised views Absolutely. instead of a relationship. But I am not stopping to be brave because he doesn't agree with me. Yeah. But I won't stop being kind because it's difficult. I'm going to keep being kind. Totally. Oh, couldn't agree with you more. You and your wife, Gavin, have written this book, mm. Unleashed the Axe church today I, I love the title unleashed go on how how did you end up with the word unleashed yeah it was um it was very clear to us that as a church we need to go back to some of the basics of yeah. the early days you know and and the, the spirit fueled early church did stuff that we would just think was balmy yeah so the idea of being unleashed is not so much to say whether you are you might not feel leashed now but do you feel liberated into all you can yeah. be in Jesus? What does it look like to be the Acts Church? What does words, works and wonders look like? Yeah. Now, you and I will have had debates with people. Yes. What's more important, social action or evangelism? Yeah, yeah, yes. You've never had a debate, have you? <laughs> What's more important, <laughs> words or wonders? I know. It doesn't happen. We've dropped them. We need to get those back. Yeah. You think in Acts 5, when you know the apostles are preaching in the square, they get put in prison. Yeah. The Sanhedrin are working out where they are. They're back out in the square because the angel let them out to preach again. Living sort of outside of social orthodoxy, but totally. proclaiming. Or Philip leaving Samaria. You and I wouldn't leave Samaria. Well, I wouldn't. Samaria's exciting. It's like the best conference ever on acid. Everything's happening. It's unbelievable. Leaves it to go to a desert, middle of a desert, meet one yes. eunuch. But that eunuch's first person to take the gospel to Africa. You know, we, we don't see what God sees. Yeah. And I think the returning to the early church with an acceptance that actually we need to share life. Church is not an hour and a quarter on a Sunday morning running away at the end. It's, a, it's sharing life. We need to spill out into the streets more. We need to use words, works and wonders. We need to be more afraid in a right way of the Lord than we are of the world we're in. Definitely. And we need to realise you get one shot at life, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the Acts of the Apostles, because they acted. I mean, they, they took the Great Commission seriously, didn't they? Mm. Mm. And I mean, it's all there. I mean, what would you say are, are the key 
principles, having really dug deep yeah. into the book, what would you say are the key principles from the book of Acts that we should adhere to today? Yeah, I think that, I, th I think the words works and wonders I've mentioned, so holistic outreach. Let's stop debating what's more important, right? Why would you paint someone's fence if you weren't gonna tell them about Jesus? Yeah. Equally, if you told someone about Jesus, why wouldn't you paint their fence? Yes. And then if someone, if you're trying to lead someone to Jesus and they've got a broken arm, why aren't you praying for it? Yeah. So, you know, that sense is there, the togetherness, yeah. you know, the body, yeah. the fact that, you know, the fact that they also found different roles for different people. Yes. We too often think we've all got to do this or this and that. No, 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 you go together. I think also the boldness. You know, when Peter preached, preached before the Sanhedrin, I, that would have taken some bottle, wouldn't it? I, go, I get to go yeah. to some places, but I'd like that kind of boldness. Yeah. He was fearless, wasn't he? Yeah, oh, complete, completely. Yeah, but, but then, there was this empowerment of the Holy Spirit yeah. that, that they had. And, and there was a purity, wasn't there? I mean, take the story of Ananias and mm. Sapphira. You mm. know, there was a purity mm. in the church that wouldn't put up with this. Yeah, yeah. Do you think we've lost that purity? Um, I think we've had too much time on our hands, if I'm honest, if you were to push me. In the Western church, we have issues they don't have in the non-Western church. We have too much time to talk about too many things. Yes. In, in other parts of the world or in the early church, they're urgent for the gospel. So if we've lost our urgency, we spend all our time debating things that are important, but they may be fourth or fifth in the importance instead of actually saying there's a world to reach. There's, do, do we believe that there is going to be a heaven and a hell? If we do, we better crack on. Do we believe that there's a nation to change and to change now? And also the togetherness. I'm so challenged because off the back of this, my wife and I are planting a church yes. and trying to live some of this. And do you know what the challenge is really? The real sharing of possessions. So what happens if um, there's some other people in our church who've got two cars, say, and we've chosen we can only have one car because we can only afford one car. Their car breaks down. They can't fix it, but we've got some money in our bank. How does that work? What does that do? What does it mean when it actually says, you know, about sharing your food and sharing your table and sharing your home? Does, that, does everything I have belong to Jesus or does it belong to me? Yes. Because in the United Kingdom, we've been taught to collect stuff. Yeah. So I'm building up a nice pension so we can retire nicely. You get a nice home so everything's fine. The early church didn't like that. Yeah. So it, someone in need, reach out, make a difference. I think as well, massive thing from the early church, everyone plays. Yes. I think we might have lost some of that. Everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to be involved. Everyone gets to, to Yeah, there's no spectators. No. Everyone's a participator. And there's no buildings. Yeah. Now, I'm not against buildings. Of course. But, but if you speak to people like Alan Hirsch, missionaries around the world, yes. they'll say, if you look at what slows down revivals or growth of the church, it's normally too much training or too much infrastructure. Yeah. The early church didn't have much of either but it had a Pentecost. And you think, yes. wow, what would that look like? Yeah, yes, yeah, sometimes bureaucracy um, can be good, but sometimes it can hinder, can't mm. it? And almost suffocate, mm. and um, things don't get done yeah. as quickly as they should. I, I'm really, um, my relatives are mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, mm. um, in Acts 5, where it talks about the Greek-speaking widows. Yeah and they're being neglected in the distribution of food and it's brought to the apostles. So this is an issue regarding social responsibility. Mm. And the apostles said, yes, this is very important, but not important for us. Mm. Uh, and they found seven people full of the Holy Spirit. And then they said, we will turn our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. I find that fascinating, Gavin, that Based on that one story, yeah. now of course we have to look at the whole New Testament, but based on that story, the apostolic priorities were prayer and the ministry of the word. That is a challenge to church leaders today. Oh, definitely. I don't know if you found this, but during this season, it has been the time to form good habits. Yes, it has. I mean, I'm more, more ready to meet my Jesus than I was six months ago. Yeah. Because the time I've spent in the presence, not because, not because I've had more time, but I've used it differently. Certainly when I wasn't commuting for months, yes, there was actually some habits were formed that were really helpful. And you realize, how do you spend, without spending time in the presence of God, how, how do you even do this stuff? I know. And, and so we've got to get back to some basics. I also think we've sometimes overcomplicated it. You know, the message of Jesus is, is profoundly challenging. It's the hardest call you could ever choose to follow, but it's also deeply simple. 
Yes. It's not complicated. Yeah. We've sometimes overcomplicated things, made things different. And actually, I think in this moment, when people are desperate and people are looking for hope, the message of hope we bring in Jesus, it will cost you everything, but it will change everything. It will, it will be life in all its fullness now. Let's stop talking about when we die all the time. It's great when you die that you go to be with Jesus, but now as well. How do you get through tomorrow without Jesus? That's what I love about the, the early church. Yeah. Every day, you can't get through it without Jesus. No. And I start every morning thanking God for three things. Because if you start with thankfulness, you don't want stuff. Thanking God for three things and then saying, Lord, you better help me today because I can't do this without you. I can't do what's in front of me without you. Absolutely. You tell a lovely story in here, Gavin, about a girl um, who was at this uh, conference who had a tattoo on her arm. Mm. Can you retell that story? Yeah. 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 Um, Anne and I used to run the youth work at New Wine. And it was a girl who had made her own tattoo with a standing knife. She'd written the word worthless in her forearm. Which is just tragic, isn't it? It's just tragic. So sad. And there was one night where we decided, instead of, you know, in youth ministry, the temptation is you do everything for the young people. One night we were like, hang on, the Lord's got this. So we said, the team are going to stand on the edges. We're just going to let them worship. Yes. And in the middle of one of these evenings, this girl just starts jumping around like, like, like she's crazy. We're like, what's going on here? She's jumping around, she's weeping. And she comes to the side of her friends. And this girl who had written the word worthless with the Stanley knife in her forearm, it had gone. Because Jesus looks at her and says, you are worth so much. Yes. And he takes it away. Now, would I have had the faith to pray for that? I like to think so, but possibly not. Do I now have the faith to pray for that? Yes. 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 And, and actually, in youth ministry years, five or six times, I've seen the scars go from people who've self-harmed. Because Amazing. he's a God who restores Absolutely. us. And, and I do think sometimes we so overestimate what we can do. And we underestimate what he can do. Absolutely. Whereas I want to be someone who lives saying, do you know what, Lord? I haven't got a lot, but I'll bring what I've got to you. Like the boy in the, the Philly 5000. And if you want to multiply it, please do. If you don't, I'll still bring it because I'm, I'm going to be bold. But Lord, this Amazing. is nothing without you, but with you. Think what you could do. I know. And so that was in the worship. Yeah, in the worship. It's like uh, yeah. the presence yeah. of Jesus, the sacredness. Yeah. The healing it just, just took, it away. took it away. A couple of our friends laid a hand on the shoulder praying for her, but no, no team doing it. No, none of the textbook youth work no, training was the done. usual. God, God just did his thing. But this is where, you know, I think of when I was a boy and I, I saw angels sometimes or, or some of the miraculous you see. Or when you've prayed for a leg and the leg has grown, you're like, this can be nothing but God. Yeah. And I think for some of us, actually, we sometimes need to go out on that faith ledge that says, I'll go, Lord. But this can only happen if you do something. Yeah, definitely. And I think too often we say, instead, I'll stay in my comfort. And I know it'll be OK. Yes. It's actually, no, only, only you can do this, Lord. Let's, let's go and let's, let's see. Go. Let's get the adventure part back of, of the early church. Definitely. That sometimes we've lost, perhaps. Gavin, a joy. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thanks for having me. Wow. I, honestly, I'm inspired. He's uh, an absolute tonic. Uh, I'm still thinking about his uh, surrender to Christ the day after his 18th birthday and uh, what an encouragement that when we surrender to Christ we just follow the Good Shepherd and uh, great to hear how the Lord has and is using Gavin. I hope you've been inspired. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.